plus. So <laughs> welcome to the COVID world where working at home and uh, is is not just uh, not not just welcome but encouraged in a lot of cases. So. Oh, I think it's it's amazing, and we're I think I mean it's one of those things where you never really know the change that's happening until you look back. And I think you fast forward a few years and we look back, we're going to say, can you ever imagine there was a time five days a week, two hours on each end of your day, you were driving to sit in a desk and do work that you technically could have done. I mean, we're watching, I think a tectonic shift happen, certainly in white collar work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I, I do remember when I was initially told, you know, well, we're going to close the office and everyone's going to be working from home. And I was at the time thinking, oh, my gosh, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> and lo and behold, um, you know, here we are two years, almost two years later. And and uh, the uh, just the idea of going back to work five days a week, as you mentioned, yeah. is just not even something that's seems <laughs> reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is great. And just for some background, I, I, I've, um, uh, Tony Smith, who I know is uh, retired. Yes. Um, uh, I spent, uh, he was great a bunch of years back uh, when I had run a fairly large mortgage brokerage. He was very helpful in, in getting our company in front of the MNP team. Uh, oh. We did, we did a bunch of business together when, when you had customers that sort of needed some financing and um, we've now got some business valuation software. So I'm hoping to knock on MNP's door one of these days and see if I can't get in there and, and do a pitch on it. Uh, but today, I guess just to flesh this out a little bit, uh, Rick, what is in four or five sentences? How do you spend your days? I spend my the bulk of my days talking with business owners uh, and stakeholders about businesses that are either going through a form of restructuring or a form of insolvency or are contemplating it. And depending on who I'm talking to, just the various options that are available to them in their, you know, in, in their capacity, what it would look like as the process moves forward and potential outcomes. Well, I think this is going to be a great chat. So for the last couple of years, I have a, a podcast. It's really designed not to be uh, coaching or motivation. It's really just meant to be very practical, straight talk that entrepreneurs can benefit from. And so as we go through this conversation, maybe the picture in your mind could be an entrepreneur generally is a very lonely person. There's not a lot of people they can talk to. And so oftentimes they'll think to themselves, just because they don't have context, I must be the only entrepreneur going through this, or my business must be the only business experiencing these particular challenges. And so over the last couple of years with my podcast, I've been able to flush out a series of issues and challenges, today's topic being one of them, where an entrepreneur goes, okay, don't sugarcoat it. Just tell me what I need to know. Tell me what steps I need to take. What am I going to be up against? And if I was looking to make sure I didn't bury my head in the sand, how do I make the best decisions possible? So as you and I chat, just think in your mind that you're, you're yeah. sort of talking to an entrepreneur that's very much uh, on their own, on an island. They probably are running an organization of anywhere between 50 to 500 people. Most of these businesses roll up to the entrepreneur. And so on a podcast like this or a conversation like this with an individual like you, it's really meant for them to hang up the earbuds and go, okay, if, I, if my business is in that spot or I think it's in that spot or I haven't done anything, even though I know full well I've run out a runway that, you know, Rick has given me some things uh, to consider. So along that basis, what is usually the very first phone call that you get? Typically, the first phone call is uh, an entrepreneur, or business owner calling to to, to say that they think that their that their business is in trouble and they are concerned because they're not going to be able to make their payment to the bank if they have a bank or they're starting to get concerned about being able to make payroll that's the, those two are typically the biggest the the, the biggest given my out there 
I'll jump in for, for just a second because no, my sorry. experience is that that phone call a lot of times comes too late. And so I know in a lot of the situations I've been a part of, an entrepreneur will say to themselves, you know what, next month it's going to be better. Oh, if I just get that contract, this whole thing is a waste of time. And I yeah. think the reason they do that is there's some shame, there's some pride, there's some ego. But in a perfect world, when would a business owner call Rick? Ideally, as at the, at, at the instance, which is a pretty finite term, as you know, Sure. At that, at that, at, at that initial inkling that there's something that's not going well, where they're starting to have that first, second thought that maybe, may, maybe there's an issue that 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 they need to deal with, as far as the viability and and continuation of the business goes. I, that would, in a perfect world, that's when I would say that's the time that you should call because the earlier in the process that you do this and make have that that realization, the more options that are available to you. A lot of times, like you said, Dylan, that first call will come when it may be too late to to do a lot of restructuring or whether it's formal or informal. And so if we double click on that just for a minute, yeah. if an entrepreneur has a sense of, uh, I mean, fear generally comes from the unknown. So cool. calling someone like you from a psychological perspective can be very scary. Hey, I think my business is in trouble. I think my creditors are going to start pressing down on me. We just missed our last payment to the bank. CRA won't stop calling us. So there's a whole bunch of things that start coming together mm -hmm. and, and have to be pretty heavy in order to call you. But in a perfect world, First of all, I don't think it costs anything to call you and have a chat. You can correct no. me if I'm wrong. No, that's but how? What would you say to the entrepreneur who has that mental idea that I don't even like? I don't even want to consider this. Why would I talk to someone like Rick? That basically means I'm giving up, which isn't true. No, but no, what would no. you say to them? Uh, what initially the way that I start every single phone call with with a with a business owner is I say, okay, tell me what's going on, and then after we flush out all of that information, the, my second question is, what do you want to do? Um, a lot of times when I'm having these discussions, one of the real underlying things is maybe the business is just a little too much and they're looking to maybe retire or sell or do something like that uh, and or just it's too much stress finance personally and mentally for them and they just want to shut it down and getting to that initial realization can sometimes be the hardest part and a lot of times the response to the, my, my second question is I don't know and so we'll talk a little bit more and just see what the pluses and minuses are of continuing the operations, continuing the business, or maybe looking for an exit, uh, an individual exit strategy, whether it's selling the business to a potential third party or, 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 or closing the business down. It, it really depends on what the business is, what kind of opportunities are available, those kinds of things. So if a business owner senses there's something wrong, they know it, you know, deep down, they know there's something wrong, but they're just sort of Put it pushing it and pushing it and pushing it till it gets really bad but let's yeah. assume they're able to go you know that rick guy seemed like a pretty nice guy or any other uh, uh, trustee is that the right term for you rick yes yeah we're okay so i'm a tech uh, we're a licensed insolvency trustees so if they said great i'm going to talk to somebody like rick i'm going to get over myself i'm going to pick up the phone or go maybe see rick in person but i'm going to lay out kind of what my what's going on in my business He's going to ask me some questions about outcome. Mm -hmm. And then generally speaking, kind of what happens next? If, a, if an entrepreneur doesn't just say, okay, thanks for the talk, but they say, you know what, Rick, what you've said resonates with me. You're right. I probably should get ahead of this because it'll be less painful now than it will be if I wait. So what is the rest of, like, what is your job specifically as it relates to that entrepreneur and the path that you end up walking them down? Well, if the if a decision is made that they want to proceed with 
a formal restructuring or with um, or putting the company into bankruptcy or or turning it over to the bank. Um, whoever whoever the stakeholder is that would sort of take um, take over that that decision processes would be would be who I would speak with and 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 we would move forward based on what that scenario looked like. If it was the, the business owner, for example, and they wanted to restructure, you know, we'd, we'd sit down, we'd, there, I'd be asking for a whole bunch of information, things like company financial statements, um, copies of contracts, loan agreements, all those kinds of things, just so that I can properly evaluate what's going on with the business and, and work with work with the, the 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 business owner to put a to to put a proposal together that is going to you know be accepted by the creditors be accepted by the court and that they can actually execute on so are you the one that gives advice or do you carry out the instructions of of what an entrepreneur wants to see happen are you the like who oh. who are you who are you working for? Well, um, and and then and then I guess just to give just to flesh it out, can you give an example, maybe um, a fictitious example or otherwise, and protect yeah. you know protect the names and, and amounts? Um, but an entrepreneur says, okay, you know, here are all my affairs, here are my loan agreements, my accounts payable. Rick, what do you think uh, I should be doing? So, uh, what are, how do you kind of navigate that conversation? And maybe give an example. Yeah, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it's up to the individual. I can't tell them exactly what to do. It's very it. similar to when somebody goes into personal insolvency. It's a, a trustee is not here to tell tell them what to do, and I'm the same way on, on a corporation. I'm here to outline what the options are, and I will work with you to 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 uh, execute on whichever option that you elect to take. And just to be clear, when we talk about option, we're talking about uh, settling our debts or satisfying it, creditors, or what is the, the goalpost you're trying to get an entrepreneur through? It's, it's basically, if it's, if it's compromising the debts, it's going to be through a, a proposal to the, to the, to the company's creditors, whether that's done under the bankruptcy and insolvency act or, under the company's creditors arrangement act which is a separate piece of legislation but still provides the same relief at the end of the day for a corporation the big difference is there's a five million dollar uh debt requirement that you're required to have in order to utilize the ccaa and um, otherwise it's if the decision is made to shut the business down they can assign the company into bankruptcy the thing to the thing that always takes, um, the, the thing that always needs to be made clear is the, the trustee is an officer of the court. We uh -huh. work for all, all stakeholders. So we, we work with the company, we work with the creditors, we work with the court. We're, depending on what our specific role is, if we're a monitor under the CCAA, for example, we're... In, in that situation, we're the eyes and ears of the court. We report to the court on how the business is operating, that sort of thing. If we're the trustee in a proposal where we're, the company is, is restructuring its affairs, it's compromising its debts to its creditors, we're doing, we're, we're acting for all parties. We, we, we work with the company. We also take instructions from the creditors because at the end of the day, it's, it's a process that's affecting them. They have to agree to a less than, less than what they're owed. So almost like a quarterback, you're, 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 you're not, you're not the owner or the coach as it were, you're just making sure that all of the parties are doing what needs to be done to ultimately, I guess, satisfy the obligations to the best degree possible. Is that the, exactly? And yeah. and and the upside on the restructuring is that on, you know, at the end of the day, and, and this is sometimes a hard a hard pitch to get past the past the creditors is they're giving up something today, 
for those ongoing relationships and profits tomorrow. Yeah, that's a little bit of an ideology that you have to it, you have to be able to buy into a little bit. And absolutely. depending on who the stakeholder is, that might not absolutely. resonate with them. Yeah. Yes. And, so when an uh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that the, the the big thing, some with depending on who the creditors are, and the sophistication of those creditors, that that can be a bit of a challenge. But at the end of the day, uh, it's a it, it's a majority rules type of situation when it comes to voting on on the proposal and and and, and whether or not it passes. So, so given that you're in the hub of all of these different parties, what is the most frustrating part for you, or what's the part that when a Friday afternoon comes, you're like, oh, all right, thank goodness this week is over because I tell you, blank. Um, it's it really depends on the situation. <laughs> <laughs> um, some days it's um, the 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 biggest peril is those Friday afternoon surprises. Okay, and and by that I mean. Um, there always seems to be a situation where something comes up on a Friday afternoon, whether it's, you know, if you're working with a, with, with a, with a business and putting their, putting their proposal together or their, their, the bankruptcy is, is, is moving forward and they're liquidating the business or whatever. Uh, something will come out of the woodwork. All of a sudden, you find out that there's a, a, a creditor who it wants to repossess all his goods, or he just helps himself. <laughs> I can imagine. Right, shows up, right, right. Shows up at you know, shows up at the warehouse with a truck saying, "I'm coming to. I haven't been paid, and I'm picking up all my stuff." And uh, and panic sets in. Right? And, and and well. For some, yeah, panic will set in. I'll, you, know, you always get that phone call. Uh, what do I do? What do I do? And it's like, well, right. they're not allowed to take what you know, they're not allowed to take their stuff back, uh, not without the approval of the trustee. And, and and if I don't have any information to support them coming back for this, and they can do it in certain situations, um, it's 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 always those kinds of situations that seem so. To Friday afternoons sound a lot like someone trying to leave on vacation too, right? You think you got everything lined up and then just because somehow the world knows you're going on vacation, all of a sudden <laughs> everything I, starts to become unraveled. So it's sort of I, the same exercise, I guess. I literally almost hate taking vacations. Now. <laughs> <laughs> For that reason. So as you, so again, being in that quarterback position, um, mm -hmm. And I think that's helpful for, for entrepreneurs to understand because you don't necessarily work specifically for the entrepreneur as well as you don't work specifically for the creditors. You really are there to manage all of the pieces to get the outcome uh, that is based on either um, the proposal that was made to creditors or whatever the, the regulations uh, under law we, say. So you're the, we, we, we you're are the quarterback. Bound, yeah, exactly. We are bound by the by the terms of the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act or the CCAA, whichever we are, we, I mean, we do, we, we, we do report to the court. We do report to the creditors and we do take instructions from both. Right. So, uh, so, if an, and, so, so go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, so sometimes that will, that, that, that does have the potential to go in, 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 con, in a, in a contradictory fashion to what uh, a business owner may may want but uh at, at the end of the day it is the creditor's um decision to make uh, on on to uh, on whether they're going to be satisfied with the with with proposed outcomes do you find that that for i guess two questions i was thinking mm -hmm. of uh, one is is an entrepreneur best to talk and work out their issues with their creditors directly or are they better to get in touch with you if that's what they wanted to do how would an entrepreneur consider that 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 uh, intersection it would it would really depend if, if there's nothing wrong with an entrepreneur going out and trying to settle the debts on their own and ideal in an ideal world that could work in a situation where there's only a couple of creditors 
Got it. And it, it, if there's individual arrangements that can be made, informal, in, informal arrangements happen all the time. So it, uh, it, it's certainly not an, uh, an uncommon practice. The big thing that, uh, that can impact it is whether or not it's going to be binding. Got it. Because they may make it a, they may make an arrangement, you know, if they have three creditors, for example, they may make an arrangement with, with all three, but if one of them suddenly has a change of heart and doesn't want to agree to it, there's not there's nothing there that really binds them. So an entrepreneur would have to sort of finesse it together exactly. and maybe, I guess, maybe just following up with your earlier comment, uh, if they think that's something that they're going to have to deal with, even just giving you a phone call could pro or you or somebody like you could help yeah. them sort of stick in through that. So the second question I had then was, so an entrepreneur, a lot of it's kind of fear driven at the front end, mostly because of the unknown. They're, they've never talked to someone like you. They're unfamiliar with the process. It seems very, very scary. But once they get over that hurdle and now, you know, they've, they've, they've shown you how bad things are. And so there's an, there's an element of, of uh, peace <laughs> that comes from that because now it's not just in their head. They yeah. finally said it out loud to somebody. Where do you find that entrepreneurs get the most frustrated after that point as they start going down the road to settling up their affairs? Well, a lot of times it will come from getting between what they were mentally expecting it to be and what that reality ultimately ends up being. And uh, is that a result of sophistication, uncertainty, sometimes. or is it just the natural course that these things take as you get a whole bunch of parties in, in an engagement that where people are trying to unravel the ball of yarn? Where does that come from? It, it comes frankly from all of them, uh, every, hmm. every single, every, every single aspect and because it can be an extremely confusing and frustrating process. Got it. Um, it 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 sometimes goes back to the, the the different parties that they're doing business with, and their level of sophistication. So there there's certainly opportunities where you can have a scenario in your head, and even have preliminary discussions with certain certain vendors creditors and uh, where you think that you've got them lined up and everything is going to move forward and then something happens on their end and the next thing you know and life happens you think you're, you're, you think you're 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 all you know going down the same path together and all of a sudden there's a left turn that takes place and and uh you're either drugged down a road you don't want to go down or you're standing there by yourself. And then that, so, if, that, the, that so if, if you find that the, the gap is between their expectation at the beginning versus what happens in reality, do you have a Northern star or, or a piece of, of advice that you could give to the entrepreneur to say, look, part of this is reasonable expectations, but that will change because of the number of parties involved, the seriousness of the, the situation, the sophistication level of the people involved. But here's the thing you got to keep your, your focus on. What would that, what would that thing be, Rick? Well, the, I mean, the, 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 the North star that you are eloquently putting in is, um, There's a difference, and this is a f one aspect that a lot of entrepreneurs really struggle with at times, especially the ones that I've spoken with, is they have a hard time differentiating themselves from their business. Oh, oh, that's a very good every, piece of advice. Yeah. Every, the, the thing to remember is, and it, entrepreneurs are, are very parental it's the business is their is, is their baby it's their livelihood they've watched it grow like a child and a lot of times the hardest thing is is not being able to accept 
that this specific iteration of a business is has has a long life cycle. Yeah, that's interesting. That would be very consistent with with my experience as well. Is that you you can't separate yourself from your business. It is you. And so and there's like, first of all, there's like an identity problem there because there is that's you. But even just practically, I mean, if you're not a pragmatic individual and this thing at some point experienced your business, rather experienced a measure of success, mm -hmm. you attach yourself to that. And so all of a sudden, when the normal course of, of business happens, you have a hard time detaching, which would make interactions with people who want a different outcome than you want. It would make that interaction very strained and very and frustrating, I would imagine. And very personal. And very personal, yeah. So, and that's that's really the toughest hurdle for, again, the, this is just from entrepreneurs and business owners that I've spoken with over the over, over thirty years plus or minus of of doing this. It's separating out the individual from the business, and you know, even when I'm talking with somebody and talking through, you know. When I asked that first question, what's, you know, tell me what's going on. And we'll start off with things going on in business. And before you know it, it's things going on in their personal life as well. Oh, sure. And, you know, how is this going to affect, how does it all affect me? And it's like, well, okay. So we need to, first of all, carve out what's going on in your personal life is, 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 important but it's not what can what we can deal with from the necessarily from the aspect of restructuring a business or liquidating the business or 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 making some kind of a, a plan of arrangement or proposal back to creditors of the business it, it's really sp splitting those two things apart and and having entrepreneurs understand that you're you the business is the business and as much as you're as much as that business owner is is a part of the business it is still a distinct and separate thing from from the business from, yeah. so last couple of minutes here we've talked about yeah. some pretty some pretty weighty things let's talk about some positive things what are maybe a couple of examples that you can give where uh, a business has has spoken to you uh, an, an entrepreneur rather has spoken to you they've been able to sort out their business and life believe it or not continued the sun rose the next day yeah. and they got through it what would just be a very simple example that any entrepreneur who's never been through this before could at least use as an understanding of wow this sounds scary but life will go on and if i can separate myself from my business be a little bit more pragmatic Rick, what can I expect out of this? Give me an example. Sure. Um, we, I, I, I was working with a with a with a with a company that they had just bought some assets uh, from a company that I that I had that was in the uh, that that was selling. You know, that they, they had gone bankrupt. They were, we were selling all the all the assets, and this entity came out of really nowhere and bought a bunch of the assets and and then came back to me a couple of months later and said we're we've we found another investment that we want to make in a company but they're hopelessly insolvent and what we want to do is do a proposal to the company creditors we're going to fund it and the company's creditors can can vote on it and if it works great if not um, the company goes bankrupt and, and, and everybody loses. And so I, I sat down with the company and we, we worked out a, a proposal to the creditors and initially there were a lot of creditors that really didn't want to agree with it, but after some discussion and some and and the benefit of a little bit of time to sort of you know think about things rationally the decision thankfully at the end of the day that the creditors made was they were going to accept the proposal and so the com and the way that the proposal was structured was there was going to be a, a pot of cash but there was also going to be 
um, a contingent value note, which basically said that if the price of gas and oil went to a certain amount, that another an, an equal just up to the same amount was going to be paid back to the creditors again. Oh, it's very creative. Yep. And it basically had a three year window and they hit the price in six months. So the company got its fully funded proposal, carried on operations, and then the creditors got that second payout, which the, com the company did on its own. They didn't even need me to be around to do it. So they didn't get all their money back. It was a compromise, but there's ongoing operations. People are employed. The business is, is under, you know, it's under new management, but it's doing very well now. So, so on that, that's it. First of all, great example, because I think that starts to put a lot of this into perspective yeah. is the process from an entrepreneur's perspective, is the process very rigid or can entrepreneurs be creative? Can they, you know, can they, um, uh, do they have to work within a single lane or can they just keep throwing ideas together working with you to say, Rick, will this work? Well, what about would this work? Like sometimes I think, again, in my experience is because you just don't know the process. You're really not sure where the edges are either. In the yep. example you just gave, it highlights that, well, wait a minute, there is a conversation that can be had here. I mean, just because you might've made the decision to talk to Rick, to put yourself down this path, that doesn't mean that's the end of it. I mean, you you can you can put something together oh. that would see all parties benefit. So is that does that happen? Is that part of it? Absolutely. It's it's it it can be a continual and it, it can be a continual exchange of ideas. Um, up until the point where we, you know, I I I work with companies quite often where we'll exchange back and forth on, you know, the company will come up with what they think is a, a, a reasonable pros, a reasonable proposal. And I'll say, I'll, I'll go back to them and say, well, you need to think about this. You need to think about that. Because if they're making a proposal, there are certain things that have to be dealt with. You know, you got to deal with Revenue Canada. CRA is death and taxes, right? It's yeah, guaranteed. Yeah, it's that the, her majesty lives hand to mouth. So as we all know, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there, there are certain requirements under, under those, um, under those restructurings that, you know, we have to deal with. But after that, it can be as creative as the individual that's making that proposal can be. So and there's the great some rules, about, there's some standards, but there's some room. Yeah. And it can be as creative and guess what? Entrepreneurs are pretty they could be pretty damn and creative. Yeah, they just need to know the door is open and then they can walk yeah. through it. So <laughs> Rick, as, as, as we finish up our time yeah. here, what would be, I'll, I have two questions to ask. I'll ask the, 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 sure. the, the negative one first. What's the worst thing an entrepreneur can do if they're in this spot? Wait Where they're talking long. to you and... Go wait ahead, too sorry. long and there's no options left other than to hand the keys over to a bank or just put the company into bankruptcy uh, and potentially lose, lose personal assets as a result. Because they waited, they couldn't get over themselves. They couldn't face the reality of their scenario. And so it, it's that old, there's that old poker statement, right? Your first loss is your best loss. Don't keep trying to double down on. on yeah. Something. So on the flip side of that, what's the best thing that an entrepreneur can do in this particular position? It, don't be afraid to ask for help. Ooh, that's a good one. Yep. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, nobody knows your business as well as you, but there's there's sometimes some great alternatives that are available, and things that are just not overly you know, may not be may not come front of mind when you're looking at how how to fix your business and. And, and that's what that's what we try to help people with every day is looking at potential, you know, new solutions to help them get 
get the company back up and 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 running again on the you know on the, hopefully on the premise that there's that there's a, a a good strong business there to to do that with rick there's no doubt that what you have shared here today is going to help a lot of entrepreneurs um i know you said you've never done podcasts before but no, this was you... my first one Oh, you did! No, you did. This is this is great. I think, I think you're gonna you're gonna find that um, whether you see it or not. But but certainly, there uh, I get comments, I get emails, and I'm Perfect. very certain that there's going to be some folks that will have found some relief listening to this because again, I think it's one of those things that in your head it's like the boogeyman, right? You're like, oh, exactly. this is really really bad, and I just would rather not face it. But the truth is, if you open the closet door, you realize, okay, it's bad, but. It's not the end of the world bad. It, it just means you've now got to deal with something. And the sooner you can get on it, the more proactive you can be, like most things in life, you're exactly. going to find that the outcome isn't nearly as bad in reality as it might be uh, in your head. Uh, Rick, what's the best way for f- folks to get uh, in touch with you? I'm going to include some information in the show notes, but how do you like to interact with entrepreneurs that are looking to find their uh, way down this path? The, the, the best way to reach me is by email. Rick okay. Don Anderson at, e, at mmp.ca. Uh, that's, I, I, I live with this thing beside me 24 seven. So, uh, just not on a Friday afternoon, maybe no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm afraid. On Friday afternoons. I love it. I'll answer well, it, Rick, anyway, but I'm always afraid when I open. No, that's great. Well, I appreciate your time today. Um, well, I know you, you obviously like most folks, uh, working from home, you've got, your inbox filling up and things coming in, but I do appreciate you taking the time and um, uh, we'll see you down the trail. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Rick. We'll talk soon. Take care.